You know, for over three years now, our family has been licensed uh, to do foster care. And uh, one of the lessons that we've learned is that uh, families can be very fragile. Um, even at a very early age, children that, who are neglected are forced to learn ways to, to cope. And uh, we've seen children who will just keep eating and eating at a meal until you intervene because uh, they've learned that their parents can't be trusted to provide food on a regular basis. So when the food's there, uh, they just keep eating. Uh, we've seen children develop ways to get attention, you know, kids who can turn their tears off and on at the, in the blink of an eye. Um, we saw a two-year-old girl who was already able to flirt, right? Uh, we, a three-year-old boy who had learned to use the F word to get attention. Somebody thought that was funny to teach him that. Uh, and some just give up on getting attention. I mean, they'll go off and play on their own for hours. I mean, it's, it, you see all of these things, even from their earliest days. Their broken relationships with their parents have this distorting effect on their lives that will make relationships difficult for them for the rest of their lives. We all face, I know, we all face some kind of challenges with, from our personalities, our upbringing, but theirs are just so much greater. Um, and now I share this because when it comes to our relationship with God, I think in a way we're all kind of like those kids. Now God has never neglected us, but ever since Adam and Eve first sinned, every human being has been born into this broken relationship with God. I mean, ever since they first ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, the inclination of our hearts has been uh, to develop ways to cope and get through life without God. You know what I mean? We put other things in His place. We put people in place of God. We put marriage, we put kids, money, food, sex, work, entertainment, even religion. We get by, but we always know that something's missing, that something's not right. There's only one person since Adam and Eve who's had uh, been born into a right relationship with God, and that's Jesus. And we've been talking about the life of Jesus. Now we've been, been going through our, our Bible reading schedule, a 90-day Bible reading schedule, and today is day 48. So we're over halfway. Um, and, and we've been going chronologically through the New Testament Gospels. Now, it's not too late to jump in if you still want to join us in that. Um, you can pick up a copy of that reading schedule uh, in the back this morning. Or you can download a copy from the resources page on our website. But as we, as we read through the Gospels, you can't, you can't help but see the depth of Jesus' relationship with His Heavenly Father. And it comes out in a number of ways. In, in John 5, 19, we read these words. It says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. I mean, Jesus has this incredible dependence upon God the Father. In fact, uh, we'll read this week in John chapter 10, verse 30, this verse, it says, I and the Father are one. Now, Scripture leads us to understand that oneness between the Father and the Son as the sharing of the same essential divine nature between Father, Son, and Spirit. We see that God is, is one in, in three persons. But that also talks about the relationship that's there. Right? There really is this perfect relationship that began in eternity past and continued after, after Jesus became man, after the incarnation. And he shows us what it's like to have a perfect human relationship with God the Father. Now, I think one of the clearest demonstrations of that is seen in how Jesus prays. Time and again, as we go through the Gospels, we see Jesus sneaking off for, for time alone in prayer, time to speak with his heavenly Father. And Luke's Gospel particularly brings that out. 
In Luke 5, 16, Luke tells us this. He says, Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And he, he shows us uh, Jesus praying at several different times where the other Gospels don't mention it. For instance, when at the baptism of Jesus, when it describes the, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, Luke is the one who tells us Jesus was praying at that moment. Luke's the one who tells us how Jesus spent the whole night in prayer before he chose his 12, uh, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. Luke's the one who tells us that when Jesus was transfigured, you know that, that time when he takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain and, and the glory of Jesus is revealed to them? Well, Luke tells us that they went up to the mountain to pray. So it's no surprise then that Luke would also capture an occasion when one of the disciples comes and asks Jesus to teach them how to pray. And it's found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Of course, we know this as the Lord's Prayer. And a longer version of it is found in Matthew chapter 6 as part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But we know from reading the Gospels that Jesus was in the kind of ministry where he traveled from place to place. And it would make sense that in that kind of ministry that he would repeat things. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount probably occurred a year or so before this event. Uh, the sermon, that sermon was, was in the northern part of Israel, in Galilee. That was the, the setting there. But this, this event here that we just read in, in Luke 11 uh, seems to take place around Judea, the, the area right around Jerusalem in the south of Israel. And it's probably only five to six months before the crucifixion of Jesus. I kind of wonder if this disciple, whoever it was, of course he's not named here, uh, if he really understood what he was asking or, or the answer that Jesus gave. Because Jesus wasn't giving him a prayer to repeat verbatim. We know that because in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, before he, he introduces the prayer there, uh, Jesus says this, he says, when you are praying... Do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Right? This wasn't supposed to be something that was just to be repeated over and over and over again. Sadly, people have taken it that way. But, you know, here's another thought. If Jesus did intend it to be that, then he would have given the same prayer here in Luke 11 as he did in Matthew chapter 6. But it's not the same. It's different. Right? The prayer in, in Matthew 6 is, is longer. It has a few more lines to it. Uh, this, so so there's, there's differences. He didn't give us words to say. That wasn't the point of this. Here's what I think the point of this really is. This, the point of this prayer here is that Jesus shows us six ways to relate to God. Now, why do, I, why do I say it that way? Not just prayer requests, but ways to relate to God. I say it that way because you can say the words of the Lord's Prayer, but if it doesn't reflect the reality of how you relate to God, then it doesn't mean anything. So we need to get down to the heart of this and say, well, what, what are these prayer requests? What are they really pointing to? What does it show us about how to relate to God. And the first thing that it shows us is this, to relate to God as your father. You know, when, uh, when my kids were little, they used to love being tossed up in the air. And uh, they're so confident that I would catch them. You know, it's really a little bit naive. Um, <laughs> 
Because sometimes dad isn't able to catch them, right? You know, there's a point where they grow up and they get too big for that. Um, and I don't, I don't know what your relationship is with your earthly father, but if you expect perfect trustworthiness from him, you won't find it, right? I mean, that's the reality. Every earthly father has weaknesses. Uh, he makes mistakes. He commits sins. And those things will undermine your trust in him. But it's not that way with your heavenly father. In there in verse 2, Jesus simply says to call him father as we speak to God to address him as father. But if you look down further on in the chapter, down to verse 11, I think Jesus elaborates on what, what the fatherhood of God really means. Look at verse 11. He says, now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, will, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, his point is that God cares for us, and he has our best interest at heart. So we can trust him. We shouldn't hesitate to share our burdens and, and our concerns with him. And when things don't turn out the way that, that we would like them to go, we shouldn't doubt him. He knows best. So our Heavenly Father is perfectly wise, powerful, and loving. And so just even in that first word of the prayer, to call God Father, says so much about how you relate to him. Is that, is that how you relate to God? Do you look at him as a perfectly trustworthy, good and kind father? Not just in how you speak to him when you pray, but all the time in life. Trust your heavenly father. Secondly, as we move on into the prayer, we learn this, to relate to God as your creator. Now, I think this is what Jesus is getting at when he says, hallowed be your name. And the first question we have to answer is, what does the word hallow mean anyway? I mean, most English, the major English Bible translations all use the word hallow because we've come, gotten so used to hearing that word from the King James. Uh, but I mean, when's the last time you used the word hallow in a conversation? Can I see a show of hands? No, you haven't, right? Um, to hallow is to treat something as if it's holy. To treat it as if it's set apart, as if it's unique. In other words, it means to show reverence. It means to show honor. Specifically here, Jesus says it's showing uh, that kind of reverence and honor for God's name. Now, what, again, what does that mean? Um, are we talking about how you say the word God? Are we supposed to be uh, like the Jews who would substitute some other word because they wouldn't want to say the word God? Is that really the, the point of this? No. When the Bible talks about God's name, it has to do with, with his person, with his glory, his reputation, his character. So to hallow his name is, is to show reverence, respect, and honor for God in everything that you do. So what does that have to do with him being our creator? What's, what's the connection here? The reason I, 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 I make that connection is this. To, to hallow God's name, like we said, is to treat him as being different than us. That's what holy means. He's unique. He's set apart from everyone and everything else. And God's uniqueness, his otherness, is rooted in the fact that he is our creator. Think about it. If he is the one who created all things, who created the universe out of nothing, then everyone and everything else is what? He's the creator and we are the creation. Right? We are his creatures. He is the only creator that sets him apart. He's distinct. He's separate. 
And what we're saying is that includes, inherent in that is, is this burden to honor him, that he is worthy of respect because he is creator. You see, God being creator is the foundation of his authority. He has authority over us as our God because he made us. For him to be creator, it's the, in a way, it's, it's the essence of what it means to be God. Right? To be before all things. To be the one to, to create things. And so to, to uh, hallow God's name is to acknowledge him. It's to honor him for who he is. That he is the creator. He's God. But something that I think gets lost here when we, when we look at this prayer is that this is a request, not a statement. It's not saying, God, I hallow your name, that I want to respect you as creator, as God for who you are. But it's really saying, God, let everybody in the world respect you. Let everybody hallow your name. Let everybody see that you're holy. Not just me, but everyone. And so to pray this raises the question, are you really concerned about that? Are you really concerned about God being worshipped? Are you really concerned about people looking at God and recognizing who he is? Because that's what it means to pray this prayer. Hallowed be your name, God. Let people everywhere See who you are. Let them respond to you the way that you deserve. That's relating to God as our creator. Is that how you relate to him? Thirdly, as we move on through the prayer, the next point that comes out is to relate to God as your king. I came across a great article the other day, and the title was the most offensive word in America. Can you guess? Do you know what it was? It's, it's an S word. Yeah, it's the word submit. Yeah, you thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? You were... I got gotcha. you. You were getting worried there. Uh, it's ironic. I mean, we live in... A, we live in a culture where we love stories about kings and queens, right? And yet, we hate the idea of, when a, go of a government telling us what to do. Um, that attitude of, of our, our independence, that may really hinder us from understanding what it means to relate to God as king. Because we live in a society that so much does not like the idea of kingship. But at the end of verse 2, what does Jesus say? How should we pray? He says to pray, your kingdom come. What does that mean? Is it, is it just a way of saying, I submit to you as my king? Uh, that's certainly part of it, but it, there's more to it than that. The ultimate answer to this request, the way that the kingdom comes, is for Jesus to return, for him to come in glory and power to reign as king over the entire world. Remember the, the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, back in Matthew chapter 5? Those Beatitudes tell us that when the kingdom comes, those who mourn are comforted. It tells us that when the kingdom comes, the gentle inherit the earth. That those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are satisfied. That those who are pure in heart will see God. See, you can think about it this way. In the kingdom, everything's fixed. Right? It's, in the kingdom, there's, there's no more tears, there's no more crying. Everything is, is the way that we want it to be. And so to pray this prayer, to pray your kingdom come, is to say, I don't have the answers. That God, you're the only one who has the answers to life. You're the only one that can fix this fallen world. Do we believe that? Do we live that way? As if God's the one. 
He's got the answers. Not me, not our government, not anybody else, but him. I need him to come and set up his government. Do you pray for the kingdom to come? And of course, as we've seen previously in, in our study of the Gospels, not everyone gets to enter the kingdom. Right? That's where we come back to the idea of submission. Because we submit now to him as king, even before he comes, so that when he does come and establish his kingdom, that we can enter into it and be a part of it. Part of praying for the kingdom, then, is praying that people would be prepared. That people would start to submit to him now and to recognize him as their king and own him as that. To submit to him. So we have to relate to God as father. We have to relate to him as creator. And we relate to him as our king. Fourth, as we move down through this passage, we also relate to God as our provider. How often do you go grocery shopping? I know it's a strange question. Do you plan everything out and go once a week? Or are you the kind of person who just kind of wings it and goes whenever you, you need something? Or are you really the super organized person who like tries to go once a month? My wife tried to do that for a while. That didn't work very well. Um, I mean, how much do you stock up? Do you have enough food for, for days? Weeks, months, some of you with your freezers, you may have food for years, right? I mean, in our society, here's what I'm getting at, we're used to having an abundance. That's just part of life in America, uh, for most of us. But Jesus tells us to pray. What does he say? Give us each day our daily bread. Here are so many implications of praying that way. First, focus on each day. Don't worry about next year, next month, next week, or even tomorrow. Focus on today, right? Trust God to provide today. Let him take care of you. That's what this prayer says. It's part of relating to God. Next, Jesus tells us to pray for what? For bread. He doesn't say to pray for cake. He doesn't say to pray for steak. Right? He says bread, the basic necessities of life. Now, how many of us find ourselves pursuing luxuries rather than the necessities of life? It right? shows, us, shows us where our heart is. And third, if God gives you bread... If he just gives you the basic necessities, will you be content with it? We get used to having so much more. And what about this? What, what about when your pantry, your fridge are all full? Should you still ask for your daily bread? Well, yeah, if you have an abundance you need to remember that it's given to you by the hand of God. And no matter how much you have stored up or what preparations you make, everything can be taken in the blink of an eye. I mean, that's the reality, right? A fire, a tornado, a flood, or where I grew up, an earthquake. And it can all be gone. So we have to come back to this point that God is our provider. Do we, do we live that way? Do we trust him? Do we look to him as our provider each and every day? Because you know what? If we do, it will lead to contentment. If we're trusting him to provide, and then he does, then we should be content. Whether or not we have all the luxuries and the other things, it's rooted in this dependence upon God as our provider. A fifth way to relate to God that comes out of this passage is to relate to him as your judge. Even in our American system of government with all its checks 
and balances, judges still exercise very significant authority. One example of that we've seen is in the foster care system where a judge decides whether to restore a child to their parents or to legally sever that relationship. Of course, in the spiritual realm, our judge and our father are one and the same, right? But that doesn't in any way lessen his standard of justice. So we come to verse 4, and Jesus teaches us to pray what? Forgive us our sins. As our judge, God has a perfect standard of righteousness. And the slightest variation from it is sin. Whether it's intentional or unintentional. Whether it's us doing something that he forbids or it's us failing to do something that he commands us to do. Whether it's carried out physically or verbally or even mentally whether it's public or private. All of us commit innumerable sins. And they, that places us in direct opposition to our judge. So we relate to him as those who are undeniably guilty, without defense, without excuse. You have to say, what right do we even have to ask forgiveness. None. We throw ourselves completely upon his mercy. And thankfully, he is a truly merciful judge. We have only to ask, and he's willing to forgive. And yet his mercy is costly. Not to us, but to him, isn't it? Because justice must be satisfied. If we are to be forgiven, then someone must pay the penalty for our sin. Over in 1 John chapter 2, we read these words. It says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, or we might say the, the sacrifice of atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That's the, the gospel, the good news. Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins so that God could maintain his perfect justice and still be merciful to us and forgive us. Now, going back to Luke 11, when we ask God's forgiveness... Jesus tells us that as we do, do so, we should, it should involve a commitment. Look at how it's worded there in verse 4. He says, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. How can we not show mercy to people when God has shown such incredible mercy? far greater mercy to us. See, that's, that's what it means to relate to God as our judge. That we have this humility, this mercy in the way that we relate to people and, and this dependence upon God's forgiveness. Do we, do we really have that kind of relationship to Him? That consciousness of of our sin and what it costs him. There's one more thought here. And it's to relate to God as your shepherd. You know, one of the main pictures of leadership in the Bible is the shepherd. He's responsible to care for a flock of sheep. He has to, to lead them to green pasture so that they can eat. He has to lead them to still water so that they can drink. He has to lead them away from places uh, where predators might lurk. And I think that may be the picture that Jesus has in mind in, in this last line in the prayer. At, there at the end of verse 4, he tells us to pray, lead us not 
and to temptation. You ever thought about that? I mean, do we really have to pray that? Uh, would God ever lead us into temptation? Certainly not. When we look over to James chapter 1, we read these words. James says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. The problem is not with the leadership of our shepherd. Right? The problem is the wayward hearts of dim-witted sheep like us. Because what happens? I mean, think about it. What happens when we see temptation off in the distance? We want to go over and check it out. Right? We want to go, we want to go see. And we tell ourselves, I'm strong. I won't give in. I, I just want to see what this is all about for other people, right? So, so naive. So easily led astray. We all are. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation. Here's what we're asking. We're asking the shepherd to intervene when we begin to wander. We're saying, poke me, smack me, you know, do something. Just keep me away from that. Even when I, in, in my own foolish sinfulness, want to go after and pursue it, God, smack me upside the head, turn me around saying, God, I need you to be that shepherd for me. Don't let me go down that path. Are you willing to pray that way? I think that's part of relating to God as our shepherd. So prayer is not, it's not so much about the words that you say. You know, it doesn't matter if you sound eloquent or not or deep, uh, it doesn't matter how long you spend praying. It's all about living in a conscious, vital relationship with God. And that's, that's what's come out here in these words, is, is it all comes back to relating to Him. Perhaps that's why in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul said this. He said, pray without ceasing. It's not to say that we shouldn't have focused times when we pray. We certainly see that in the life of Jesus. He did. He sought those times to, to focus on God and to commune with Him. But all of life is to be this ongoing conversation with the God who is what? Who is our Father, who is our Creator, who is our King, who is our Provider, who is our Judge, who is our Shepherd. And prayer just flows out of that relationship. So how do you need to respond to God's word today? So we think about this. Maybe today is the first time you've ever heard anyone speak of having a relationship with God. And you want to learn more about that, about what that means. And I'd encourage you to join us in, in reading through the life of Jesus and reading the Gospels. As we've said, Jesus shows us what it really means to have a relationship with God. Or maybe you're ready today to begin that relationship with God. And if that's the case, tell Him that. You may have spent your whole life attending church, but never really chosen to live out that relationship with God, to embark on that relationship. Tell him you want him to be your father. Tell him you want to acknowledge him as your creator. Start looking to him as your king and provider. Seek his forgiveness as your judge. Begin to follow him as your shepherd. Maybe you've had a relationship with God for some time. But you need to really focus on one of those ways. Maybe one of, the, one of these ways of relating to God that we've talked about today. You thought, wow, I need to grow in that area. Well, if that's the case, make a commitment to that. Focus on it throughout the week. Find a way to remind yourself of it. 
and, and, and think about it as you go through the week. Maybe part of that would be memorizing these words. Again, not, not so that you can repeat it verbatim, but that so, because it is so powerfully summarizes what it means to have this relationship with God. May God lead all of us to truly know Him.